Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. This is a, a great event in a, in a wonderful place. Uh, but I would like to especially thank Ole Tillman for his uh, very graceful moderation of the event, and uh, he will continue doing so to the end. Uh, let's give a nice, a big hand to Ole Tillman. Thanks, Ole. Uh, thanks to David Market for a wonderful presentation this morning, uh, or Captain Mar Market, uh, talking about uh, leadership, uh, risk taking, in order to accomplish goals, which obviously are goals related to uh, security. Uh, I was touched by his presentation because a lot of the items that he mentioned are similar item to the one that we have in, uh, in human spaceflight. Uh, leadership, uh, managing risk, uh, having clear goals in your, that you try to accomplish in the best possible way. Uh, the only thing is, in space we have windows. He mentioned that uh, there are no windows in the, in the submarine, and uh, he has the sonar in order to figure out where are the cruise ships and the, the other, other ships. Uh, we don't have that. We move at a very high speed, obviously much faster than a, a submarine, and we have windows, thanks God. Now, uh, I'll talk mainly about opportunities and risk-taking. Risk-taking has been mentioned a few times today, already this morning in the Google presentation and the Uber presentation, and of course, in the presentation by David Marquette, risk-taking. Obviously, we take a lot of risk in going into space. Uh, as you may know, yesterday was the 30th anniversary of the Challenger accident, which happened on the 28th of January, 1986. So obviously, uh, it is a risky undertaking. That day, we lost seven crew members of the uh, Challenger spaceship, uh, which uh, was disintegrated uh, 73 seconds after liftoff from Kennedy Space Center. But it's worth taking this risk, no doubt about that. Um, generally speaking, space offers huge opportunities for practical utilization, and mainly in the area of uh, communication and precise uh, navigation and also observation of the Earth and of the weather systems. Um, and also, it, it's a wonderful tool for exploration, and uh, we can make uh, incredible discoveries when we observe the universe, the sun, the Earth, and ourselves uh, from space. It's a very hostile, however, and uh, unforgiving environment, pretty much like in a, in a submarine. You need to go through an airlock in a submarine if you want to go into the water, and sometimes there's a very high pressure in the water outside. And obviously, if you're in space, it, you are in a hostile environment that doesn't support life because it's basically vacuum. You need, need to go through the airlock also. And the art of space exploration is really to pursue goals uh, in space and uh, manage associated risks. Uh, very briefly about the utilization of space, I mentioned uh, communication and precise navigation. This is an artist's view of the Galileo satellite system, navigation satellite system, being set up by the European Space Agency uh, as an additive to the GPS system, and the Russians and uh, Chinese and Indians are doing the same thing. Space is an enormous source of inspiration. When this book was published, uh, 1953, I was nine years of age, and I can tell you this was for me a huge inspiration. Uh, on a marché sur la lune, and this uh, wonderful uh, rocket with the uh, uh, white and red squares was really an inspiration for me, and also the Capitaine Haddock and his whiskey that comes in a, in a spherical shape uh, was something that amazed me as a as a young man. Of course, now I understand why it takes a spherical shape, because I've learned physics. Obviously, if you have a weightless environment, all the directions are equal, so there's no other shape uh, for a liquid than the spherical shape that you see here. The Apollo program was a huge inspiration also, especially the Apollo 11 in the summer of 1969. I was 25 years of age at that time. A wonderful undertaking. And uh, I remember these words of President Kennedy, we do it because it is not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And of course, the difficulty of this program had as a consequence to focus all the energies and talents available in the US to accomplish this goal. We discovered uh, spaceship Earth, uh, planet Earth, pretty much like a spaceship 
very isolated in space with uh, seven plus billion crew members and no captain. And uh, we really discovered our real position as humans in the, in the universe on that very modest planet uh, revolving around the very modest star that the sun is, one of the uh, 100 billion stars in the, the Milky Way galaxy. After the end of the Apollo program, that was uh, December 72, Apollo 17, uh, the US, NASA, and the aerospace industry in the US developed the space shuttle, a reusable spaceship for access into low Earth orbit. It was another big risk taking from a political point of view, a tactical, industrial point of view, and obviously for the crew members on board. As I mentioned, we had uh, one accident in uh, 86, we had another one. Uh, with Columbia in 2003, a grand total of 135 flights for the space shuttle in 30 years, from 81, the first flight, until 2011. Now I'm going to show you the liftoff of the space shuttle from about one minute before liftoff until uh, two minutes into the ascent into space, which lasted a total of eight and a half minutes, until separation of the two solid rocket boosters. It's very, for me, a very emotional um, video clip illustrating the, the complexity and the uh, decision-making process that was taking place in this critical phase of any shuttle mission. Let's go. Zero days to launch. It's going to happen. T minus 90 seconds and counting. All systems are good. We're about 90 seconds from the launch of special discovery. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We are transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Discovery is now running off its three onboard fuel cells. Coming up on a go for all the sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 17 seconds and count. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 8, 8, 8, start, start, 2, 1, boost ignition and lift off of the space shuttle Discovery. Space for main engine cutoff. 
an amazing journey. Then we continue the ascent to space for six and a half extra minutes, and then we are on orbit. And it's a total different environment. It's silence, very high speed and silence. Beautiful view of uh, the cargo bay of the space shuttle after opening of the payload bay doors. Uh, this is a nice view of the shuttle taken from a satellite that was deployed on mission number seven of the shuttle in 1984. There was a camera, Hasselblad camera, telecommanded from the crew, so they took a selfie of themselves and their spaceship uh, uh, that you see here. You can imagine the satellite following the space shuttle with the velocity vector of the shuttle inside the, the screen. Uh, this is space shuttle discovery over complex uh, 457 in Zurich in July 2005. And uh, we're talking about leadership. Um, there was a woman commander on board. Eileen Collins was commanding that mission. That was the first mission of the shuttle following the Columbia accident about two and a half years earlier. And you see the Lake Zurich, you see the airport of Zurich, and uh, over the, uh, the right wing uh, you have complex 457. International Space Station, the shuttle, uh, has been a very productive spaceship. It was really workhorse uh, for low Earth orbit access into the, uh, in the 90s and, the, and uh, the 80s and the 90s. It allowed the International Space Station assembly in about uh, 20 flights at the end of its lifetime. Uh, you have here the crew on board ISS, which is a big cooperation program involving 15 member states, uh, the US, Russia, Canada, Japan, and 12 countries of the European Space Agency, including Switzerland. These are the crew members on board ISS now. Uh, I never went to the International Space Station, but I had opportunities on two occasions to go to the Hubble Space Telescope and do repair work. Uh, and essentially, the first mission to Hubble was in December 1993. It, was, it had been launched three years earlier, but we had some severe problem, an optical problem from the solar arrays uh, with gyroscopes, and we need to, needed to do an intervention in the space environment. And that was the first time that the shell was going to go with uh, trained crew members and tool, special tools, to do uh, repairs on a complex scientific instrument in the space environment. This is SM-1, servicing mission one, that I was part of. A great picture as we are flying. You have all recognized Australia in the background with Adelaide under the robot arm. Uh, seven crew members on board, four trained for five spacewalks that we did in a very rigorous and systematic manner in order to perform these repair work. This is a crew, uh, clockwise from the top left, Story Musgrave, the commander Dick Cavey, Jeff Hoffman, uh, Ken Bowersox, Tom Akers, Katie Thornton and myself. Um, for me, a huge privilege to be involved in a group of such a super achievers and talented people. Uh, I was privileged to be assigned another time, six years later, uh, to another visit to Hubble, servicing mission 3A. This time I was one of the spacewalkers, and here we are training in a water tank at the Johnson Space Center, Houston, to prepare for this mission. Uh, it's a good way to simulate weightlessness to be in the water environment with a proper amount of weight on each of your limbs in order to be nearly weightless and you can train properly for interventions outside of the spaceship, uh, spacewalking in your spacesuit. So we had a very high fidelity model of the telescope on the left-hand side, uh, the robot arm, one platform at the end of the robot arm, exactly like who we're going to have during the mission. Here we go. Servicing mission 3A, again, it's 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. We found Hubble, but not by chance. Obviously, the rendezvous process is a very also rigorous and systematic process in order to be uh, sure to have success or to have a very high likelihood of success. Installation of the telescope in the payload bay and three spacewalks, and this time on EVA, extra vehicle activity number two, I was there. I'm in the foreground here. Of course, you may tell me, well, but how can you prove that it's you? Um, <laughs> each astronaut has identifiers on, the, on his or her leg. You see the little red chevron uh, on a white background, which are the colors of the flag of Switzerland, in fact, which is good. And uh, Mike Foley in the background has the large red markings. So if one spacewalking astronaut suddenly floats away inadvertently, we know whether it's Mike or Claude and we can decide if we go and rescue him or not. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have all recognized uh, avionic uh, bay number one, which is uh, 
which was the location of the main computer of Hubble, which we had to exchange on this spacewalk. I'm going to show you a few pictures taken by Hubble to show the magnificent, well, from an aesthetic point of view, but also a wonderful scientific content of the pictures, high-resolution pictures taken by Hubble. This is a, the Eagle Nebula in our galaxy, uh, two columns of uh, dust and uh, gas out of which stars are born. In fact, this is a nursery of stars in our galaxy. Another beautiful view of a Veil Nebula supernova remnant. There was this star exploded about 5,000 years ago, and uh, at the distance of about uh, 1,500 light years, so it's within our galaxy, we see the remnant of this explosion of a star 5,000 years ago. Magnificent and so interesting. Uh, galaxy cluster about 2218, another beautiful picture of a large amount of galaxies. Of course, this is outside of our own galaxy, at distance of typically 100 millions or billions of light years away. A few pictures, uh, now we look downwards uh, from our low Earth orbit, oceans, mountains. This is the whole Himalaya with the northern India on the left-hand side, and then the whole Himalaya chain, this huge barrier that separates uh, Tibet from the northern India. Um, to show the Magnificent contrast that we see on Earth with the telephoto lens, we took a picture of Marrakesh. <laughs> so between the previous picture and this picture, you see the, the diversity of the landscape we have on Earth. And of course, being in space gives you a very, very special view of planet Earth. Sunset in about 20 seconds. We go around the Earth in an hour and a half, and the sunset or sunrise lasts only 20 seconds. And this is obviously a view of a southern Italy and uh, Sicily and uh, even Switzerland uh, close to the horizon, taken from the International Space Station recently. The future of um, human space exploration is going to be, in all certainty, the planet Mars. We'll go, we might go back to the moon for scientific purposes and to exploit the, uh, the resources of our uh, nearest uh, neighbor, uh, but Mars is a definite goal. We do a lot of observation of Mars with uh, probes on orbit around the planet, and also we have uh, uh, robots on the surface, uh, Curiosity in particular. Um, we'll send people on Mars. This is taken from The Martian, the movie. Uh, we will not send people alone there. It's going to be, of course, groups of people, but this is a nice view of uh, extracted from uh, The Martian movie, which, by the way, I think is a very, very good movie and uh, demonstrate the challenges of life uh, on uh, planet Mars. But we have to take care of planet Earth, because most of us, 99.999% will remain on planet Earth. The future of humanity is not in space. Uh, we have a lot of resources in space that can use us, that we can use in order to better survive in the future. Um, but we need to take care of planet Earth, fragile planets. It's our responsibility to preserve it and uh, maintain its ability to sustain life. Reaching goals and properly managing risk, uh, clear mission objective and priorities, teamwork at all levels, uh, strict operational discipline. This is really important. And when uh, spacewalking, be sure that your safety cable is uh, properly attached. Uh, be prepared to cope with failure and problem. We do a lot of training uh, with the solution to problems and uh, the resolution of uh, failures or problem in order to accomplish the mission or at least to survive. And we train a lot. Thank you for your attention.